I had mentioned there a scholarship that the Insurance Council of Texas has, but they've changed their process. So um, they're going to do it in the fall instead of the spring. How many of y'all are not graduating this fall? Are any of y'all going to be here in this, I mean, this spring? Many of y'all are you going to still be here, Nicholas? Anybody else? All right. All right. I'll, um, I'll try to figure out who's going to be here in the fall. Um, what I'm going to do is, I mean, the scholarships, they have several $5,000 scholarships. These are pretty good sized scholarships. If you in this class gives you an edge, if you did well in this class gives you an edge. So what I'll do in the fall, if I can remember uh, all of you that Elizabeth and Nicholas, who else was there, Damien, and you're working in an industry that gives you someone an edge. What they're looking for is you took this class, so they're looking for people who are interested in the insurance industry, especially the PNC. You've worked in the PNC before. That's that's the biggest thing they're looking for. So you're in this class. If you're interested in the industry, then what I'll do in the fall is um, I'll try to remember to contact you, but you might make a note to contact me. And then um, I've had a problem in the past telling students you really should apply for this, and they never do. Some of them walked away from thousands of dollars because I know they would have won it because there's not that many applicants. So it's actually putting it one of the easier scholarships. So what I want to do in the fall is once I find really good candidates is I sit down with them and help them fill out the application so that you'll not that you will be honest in it, but honest with the right words and the right focus, because uh, it is a pretty hefty scholarship. Um, We've had people win in the past, so it's like, you know, they, they want it just by default because no one else applied. Now they're no longer gonna do it just for UTSA. So that's the other thing that changed the host system now. So they used to give us four scholarships and then they say, we'll give you up to $10,000. You can split it however you want to. You can give it all to one person or not. Now they're gonna do it where the whole, all the schools are supporting, they're gonna put them all into the bucket. But I still am very, very confident that I can sit down with you and help you fill out the application because I know exactly what they're grading on. So um, they're still having trouble getting enough applicants. $5,000 is a good amount of money. It's tax free. You don't have to apply it to your expenses. So they just hand you a check for 5,000 bucks. You can do with it whatever you want to. So it's you don't even have to apply it. They used to have it go through the ETSA system. Then you had to have college expenses to apply it to, but they don't even do that. Just hand you a check and they leave. Um, so I don't know why it's not taxable. It probably should be, but I don't, they don't give you a 1099. So, so anyway, so you might make a note, but I'll try to remember. I'll probably, um, in the fall, come back to this class, look who was in here and see if I can contact a few of y'all. The other thing they have is they have a forum in the summer in July that you just say will pay all the travel expenses. So you get, you know, get a night in a nice really nice hotel in downtown. No, it's not in Austin. Where is it? It's, oh, it's in San Antonio this time. They may not pay for your hotel in San Antonio. But um, if you're an actuary, especially, it's a great networking opportunity. But even if you're not an actuary, they have a uh, speed uh, interview process where you can actually interact with companies. And um, so it's a good opportunity to get, get your name out there um so if you're interested in that i'll try to contact everybody in this class it's it's i think and well let's see so just look so it's the um uh, insurance council of texas and then there's symposium. I don't know why they call it a symposium. I don't know the difference between a symposium and a conference, but it's a symposium. There it is. July 12th, Wednesday through Friday, you get free meals. It's gonna be, oh, they say Dallas. So I don't know, um, is that where it's gonna be? Oh, so it's gonna be in Dallas. I thought they were, I was on my bike during their meetings. <laughs> I was, I thought I could hear everything going on. I thought they were talking to the St. Mary's professor that they're going to have it in his town. They must have been talking to UT Dallas guy. So there you get a trip to Dallas. Like, you know, that's like, like should be on your bucket list. Um, be a really nice hotel, a few days, interact. If you have, you have any interest whatsoever, especially if you're an actuary, you just, you know, that's part of your, what you're after. 
all kinds of big companies will be there. Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll try to remind you all of that, but we do have plenty of money to pay for, pay, pay for our, your, or your, your costs. I, I think the insurance, uh, the, uh, highway Institute that we show their website, I think they speak at it. You can see the kind of things going on. Um, it looks like they're still, they're still developing it. Um, yeah, so they're still they're still breaking it up, but they've had the so that uh, highways, I whatever that was, Institute of Highway Safety. They they give a presentation which is usually pretty cool. It's kind of the latest stuff they're doing, so it's kind of what their latest research is. And there's some other good ones. There's a legislative session, which I found really fascinating. The year I went because that's when they were setting up the Texas Wind Pool, where the state of Texas decided that they, they had this underfunded wind pool and their decision was, we just won't have hurricanes for the next five years. And that's when they voted that that was gonna be their solution and it worked out. So I guess they have a lot of very powerful legislature. So it's it's for, you know, if you're interested in this industry and all, this is a great way to get your name out there and interact with some people. USA is obviously maybe their biggest member, at least in Texas, State Farm and some others are in there. So if you're interested in that, I'll, I'll try to remember to email out um, and then actuaries, I don't know if we have actuaries in here at all. Do we have any actuaries in here? Okay, Gilbert. So I think I mentioned earlier, but just a reminder, we, we have money for exam prep and study. So if you want your study, are you doing any exams yet? Okay. Yeah, if any of our actuary majors are studying for the exam, we could probably find other money if you're studying. I don't know about the SEA or SEO. I can't remember what it is that we might be able to finagle some other things, but we have a bunch of money sitting there that we are desperately trying to spend because we can only spend it on insurance related stuff. So anyway, all right. So we're trying to give away money left and right, right, and the students don't want it. So <laughs> it's kind of hard to get y'all to take the money. But is the cost you talk about is the for actually? No, it's for any anybody interested in industries. So they have a they have whole sessions just for students. So they have this speed interview process. Where you get to interview with a lot of companies and it's mainly um claims underwriting so there's not many finance people there but they do have some actuary there's a there's a lot of actuaries at the conference itself so for actuary majors for finance majors it's just an interesting conference but you can interview so you know for underwriting jobs those kind of things they'll, they'll be looking for that so yeah it's a little bit better for actuaries than finance um all right <clears throat> so we're gonna shift into commercial insurance. It's not my forte because I work for a company never sold it. It's not radically different than personal lines other than some special properties, property insurance like boiler and machinery and pollution and theft. So there's a few special cases for commercial that you don't see, but generally it's very similar stuff. If you're getting into this industry, um, I think we talked earlier that Y'all don't really do business law anymore, but uh, wow, y'all really need business law. I would, I would almost just take this class just because you're a finance major. But um, yeah, I'm kind of amazed they don't teach all the UCC and those kind of things. It's pretty critical stuff to know. But you can probably find a course just like this. This one's, this one's on negligence and torts, which is a big part of what we're going to talk about here. Is that whole liability that you have. And what are you covering? He does a great job. I took his course myself because it's been a while since I've had business law and I didn't have to change this course very much at all. So I, it was still pretty topical. So I didn't mess up too much. Um, he does a good job. It's interesting stuff. I, I found my business law classes pretty interesting just because the cases, the cases are always pretty, pretty wild. Some of them are pretty amazing. Uh, we'll talk about a few cases here related to negligence in, in tort. So I don't know how much it costs. Sometimes these uh these uh these courses can get kind of expensive. All right, so we have a we have property insurance, very similar to homeowners insurance. You have the basic broad special types of forms. You got building and personal property are part of the form. Um, you have buildings, personal property, and then the special case with businesses is that you have people that have nothing to do with you walking onto your property. You got customers, you got other vendors. So you you have this issue of these these strangers that are showing up 
that's that's usually not a case at your house. I mean, maybe occasionally, but usually not a case. But here you got a lot of people showing up to your property. And not only that, but you got all these employees that may do the wrong things. So you got you got some issues you got to deal with. Um, you might be responsible for somebody else's property that's on your your location. So what's well, not covered, very similar to what we saw on homeowners. Very, very similar. Um, same thing with vehicles. That's your auto insurance. You can accommodate illegal things. So if your firm's storing, um, I don't know what's illegal anymore. I was going to say cannabis, but I'm not sure that's illegal anymore. But whatever, you're, you, if you're storing something illegal, that wouldn't be covered. Some can be covered by endorsement. So very, very similar to homeowner's insurance. <clears throat> I'm not sure USA, boy, I wish I could have seen this claim. They had a Christmas party. They want to make it really special in Florida. So they bought this very expensive bird. They, didn't buy, they rented a bird that was going to be sitting out in the pond. So beautiful. And an alligator ate the bird. And so I don't, wouldn't you love to see that claim filed? Wouldn't it be pretty interesting? So I don't think they own the bird. I think they only rented it, that poor bird. Um, <clears throat> all right. The coincidence short clause is very, very similar. It's the same type of thing, replacement value. It's a little bit different, but it's not that important. The only difference between homeowners and, and uh, commercial is where the deductible goes when you apply the 80%. But other than that, it, it's very, very similar. Now, the second one was a big deal under COVID. You could almost write your paper just on this. But business income. So what we're looking here is something's some covered perils happened, and you you no longer are collecting your revenues or your expenses have gone up. And there was a big issue during the pandemic of does property casualty cover the lost revenue from restaurants being shut down? And um, I actually called I I do a lot of finances for for a church, and I called them and I said, have you called your your broker on this because you know it's possible um the donations to the church will go down does our policy cover that so he called our broker and he said no we're not gonna cover that and i said okay well i just thought you'd ask and in two days later he said uh wait a minute uh we'll we'll get back to you on that so they got so many calls on this it was a big 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 deal so this is pretty unique um what they want to do is say okay you've had it has to be a covered peril and that's why they were saying the pandemic wasn't covered because the pandemic wasn't a covered peril but um it, there was some debate on that. And I know the lady, I, I should show you her paper. It's pretty amazing that she did a paper on COVID and insurance a couple of years ago. Except I need to email her and see what she's doing. Just an exceptional paper. And this is one of the issues she covered was the business income loss. Uh, I was amazed at many things she could find that COVID impacted. Um, and so it is a big debate. They had, um, I, don't, I don't think anyone actually got a claim mainly because the federal government threw so much money at the problem that people are like, you know, with my church, it was like we actually made money because the government gave us, you know, it's just some amazing money that was just flowing around everywhere. Um, they actually sent us a hundred and something thousand dollars we didn't ask for. And we said, we don't want this money. And they were like, well, just keep it because we don't know what to do with it yet. So we're like, OK. And I, I said, but they're going to charge us interest. So I want to give it back. But they, we couldn't find anybody to give it back to because they didn't know whose money it was. I mean, that's our taxpayer taxpayer money. So so I, I think the government somewhat alleviated it because they were giving away so much money during that time. Um, so it can be because the property is damaged. So I had this with the school I was working with. We always ask this question. And this is something if you're, if you're, if you're on a board or on some kind of you know private school uh, or a gym or whatever, and you say, hey, if, if the building burns down, if we have some kind of problem, we're just going to move over here. And that's what they kept telling us. There's all these empty retail space across the street. We're just going to go there. And so this policy would pay for that to go over there. It also paid for any parents that we lost to the school because of the damaged property. If they went to another school or whatever. My comment to them was, have you ever called that retail area to see if you could actually rent their space? <laughs> You know, you're just assuming that you can just, hey, we'll just jump over there. So, you know, I'm a contingency planning kind of person. 
what would we actually do if this if this building were to burn down? Where would we go? My my idea wasn't we go to the retail area, but that we call one of the other private schools in the area and see if we could actually lease some of their space since they're already in schools and it's already set up. It's not too far away. There's another private school just around the corner that probably had extra space. But I think you should call in advance and make sure you know if you're actually set up for this kind of stuff. Um, so. There's other things that can be impacted that you have to think through. You really, what you do is just it's a scenario analysis. What about a fire? What about a flood? Uh, what if it's some kind of act of, of government that says you, you're not allowed? You know, you saw what, where was it in Ohio? Uh, I forget the name. Uh, Palestine, right? Palestine, Ohio. There's probably, I mean, that would be almost a good paper. That would be this type of thing where you just, you're not allowed to go back because something like this has happened. This is when the policy would 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 help you. Um, and then you have to ask, you know, how long is this going to last, and what are the limits on your policy? Um, how long is it going to take you to repair everything? Um, time to get back to normal operations, and then you do look at lost customers, and that's obviously going to be a pretty complicated calculation to make um you may have been losing customers anyway and then just trying to figure that out so obviously you have some data there um some things are not covered um some things depending on when during the year to happen can be much more material there's extra expenses that you have that you might have to cover obviously replacing or renting or whatever there, there has been a move to because this is such a complicated product project a product because there's a lot of unknowns you're you're kind of guessing and there's some of them said let's let's forget the indemnity so you got to remember the difference between indemnify versus a valued policy so to indemnify you're trying to bring the person back to where they were before so you're actually going to look at the loss. So your auto insurance says, hey, your car got damaged. We're going to give you a new car or a replacement car. A value policy says, forget all that. We don't know how much you lost. We don't know what it is. If this happens, we give you $50,000. That's what your life insurance is. Your life insurance is say, hey, if you die, we don't know how much your life is worth. But we're going to give you a $500,000. We're going to give your estate $500,000. So that would be a value policy. So some people have actually come up with the idea that this type of policy, because it's, it's complexity, Let's just say, if this happens, we'll give you this much money. Avoids a lot of the debates. So now one thing you'll notice, and I encourage any of y'all are working with a small private school or small business, look at their policy. These are always packaged policies. It's all what they usually have a broker. We have a broker that we use that puts these all together. It may be from three or four different insurance companies, but it's all in one big package. And you'll see all of these. They're all in there different limits, different, you know, premiums, um, but your broker usually puts them all together. So you'll, you'll definitely see this one. And as I look at each one, I, I start asking questions. So I got to meet with our broker just once, but I started, what if this happened? What if this happened? I just want, I just want to know what's, you know, what our exposures are. Um, scenario analysis is a really good way to do it. We even had this one. And so that raises, questions to me, why do we have this covered by this policy? Because it looks kind of specific, but it's commercial boiler and machinery. So this is specialized equipment that you have. And it's, it's a very specialized cover. There's very, very few people who write this coverage. Um, it's essentially covering you for things that break down that cover your, cause you other losses. So, um, it results from the sudden accidental breakdown of objects falling under description of boiler machinery, boiler and machinery, um, or perils that are covered by the policy. Boiler machinery risk have some unique characteristics, mainly because it's somewhat unique equipment. Why? Because it gets hot. It's got a lot of internal pressure, a lot of electrical charge, a lot of movement, motion. Now, I don't know what half of these things are. A steam boiler, I guess I kind of know what that is. Air tanks, compressors. I don't know what a devulcanizer is. Anybody know devulcanizer? Any of y'all have a devulcanizer? Yeah, three, really? <laughs> Furnaces, kettles. I'm, 
you know, I would I would cook with the kettle, but I don't think that's what they mean. Mango rolls, refrigerating systems. So yeah, I'm asking my broker, what which of these things that we have that are actually covered by this policy? Because we're paying a premium for this. We have refrigerators, so maybe that's what they're talking about. So I'm not exactly sure. The premium was really small, so you know, obviously we it wasn't a big issue for us. Um, but the simple fact we're paying a premium for something, I want to know what is it? What is it that we're paying for that that falls under this policy? Are they just making us paying a premium just in case we find something like that? I don't know. Um, a lot of times the, the loss here is due to operator error. And so there's a moral hazard or morale hazard here. And so um, the company will actually come in and provide loss control services. They'll actually come in and say, hey, you really need to have this sitting here. You need to have that unplugged or whatever. So they have an incentive to make sure you're protecting this equipment so that it doesn't cause a claim. So you, you get kind of some, some good, because you probably don't want these claims either. It's going to disrupt your business. And if you're doing something wrong, you have someone who knows this business really well, comes in and gives you that kind of uh, advice. Uh, it covers the cost of repair and replacing the property. No deduction. So it's a sense of replacement costs. Um, that's another reason why that morale hazard is so huge. Um, it can cover some other losses. And the insurance company is quite adamant that you do certain things because if you don't, they're gonna say you don't, you're not covered until you fix that. So they they come in. I don't know how often they come in. I should ask uh where I am if they've ever, we've ever actually had the insurance company come insurance company come in and insure because I don't really think we have much of anything. And so if they say, hey, you're supposed to have this five feet away from that and you don't. So until you fix that, you're not insured. So very unique policy. And I don't know who the main companies that cover this is. It might be like an AIG or a Chubb type of companies. All right. So commercial crime, obviously very unique. Your homeowners covers theft, but not in a separate policy. So why is it a separate policy? Because you're a business, especially if you're a retailer, you got all this stuff that people want to steal. And we've seen some pretty interesting videos the last few years that, you know, um, you can, when you have people staying at home all the time, they become, you know, they get a little, little uh, antsy and, and then people start acting differently. And so it's, it, this has been, so this would be an interesting one too, right? You've seen some cities that this has been a big, big, big issue. What are these policies actually paying out? What are they actually doing? Um, so forget protects against theft, disappearance, destruction, excludes um, due to perils covered by personal pro property insurance like fire and vandalism. So we're talking true theft. Um, you may be required to have certain protective devices. Um, what about your employees? Dishonest active employees. Um, this is not covered by your commercial properties, so it, it's giving you that somewhat protection for this. Um, who's covered, who's not, it's going to be an issue. Um, it doesn't cover inventory shortages. I don't know if the firms still do inventory. When I did that when I was in high school, I think, to make like a dollar an hour or whatever it was. Um, so it doesn't cover that type of shortages. Uh, but once a dishonest employee has been discovered, obviously, future acts are not covered then got to be kicked out of the firm forgery forgery is covered it's it's covered by a lot of different ways um first of all essentially your bank shouldn't allow forgeries anyway because they have your signature card but obviously banks don't check signatures so your insurance will cover you some i mostly the bank is just going to eat it because they should have checked the signature um but alteration changing the check from one amount to another amount Extortion, this is, boy, you can almost write a paper on this. Um, there are certain countries where this has been an issue, people getting getting kidnapped for the money. Um, so, you know, that's that can be covered. Um, the threat must be to do bodily harm. They can't just threaten to harm property. And you have to report it to the authorities. You know, that's obviously, I mean, issue if they're threatening you. Um, computer fraud coverage. Um, 
Now, there have been several students who have done a paper on cybersecurity and insurance. It can be really, really interesting. It's still a pretty hot topic because there's a fear of a, a massive, massive event that would have hit so many people at once, the insurance industry couldn't cover it. So that's why it's such a, a big issue. Um, my church got hit by ransomware. It was interesting, ransomware, because they didn't want any money. They just wanted to mess us up. So I had to go do financial statements. I haven't done financial statements in a while. Uh, I had to do financial statements off the bank statement. And you know, that's because our bookkeeper wasn't really sure how to do that. So yeah, she said, just one month, I'll get back. And then just two months, just three months. It's just, it's so stressful when that happens. It really destroyed a lot, which we should be backing stuff up, right? And all this kind of stuff, but they were in the middle of a system conversion. So they got in kind of, kind of sloppy. And so, yeah, this, so um, a lot of issues there. Um, and then you have some other special coverage just obviously there's going to be restrictions on that. So unique to businesses because of uh, just the unique nature of the kind of stuff they have in the building. Inland Marine, um, you can get this kind of insurance many different ways, but if you're a business, you will have this as part of your package policy. Um, marine insurance is essentially, this says is the oldest form. There's some debate on that exactly when insurance first started showing up. I think there's some debate about marine insurance and life insurance and which which showed up first. Um, if you read um, uh, Peterson's book on capital capital ideas, he, he says we got statistics and we got statistics that gave us insurance and we got insurance that opened up all this trade because now you can insure this trade. He, he says, you can't have insurance without stats. We saw that, right, when we were reading reading uh, uh, um, Warren Buffett. So he says, once we have the statistics, we someone can actually say, hey, this is how much it costs to insure this boat because we have statistics from the past. So he argues that this, this is what opened up uh, the whole industrial revolution, or at least the uh, coming out of the dark ages. Um, so it's essentially cargo insurance covers shipments pr primarily by land or air, trucking, railroad, airline. Um, there's really no true standard policies. They tend to be all risk policies. <laughs> um, the question is who owns the property? So you probably learned this in one of your classes, FOB, point of origin, FOB, destination. So does title pass when the good goes to the transport company or does title pass when the goods are delivered? at the next location. So when does it become your property? And that would be important because that's when you have to have the, you know when the insurance is. Um, you might say, well, I don't care. I'll just, if it gets lost on the route, I'll just sue the transport company. But the transport company may have some outs for certain things that they don't cover that you might assign in the contract or they may not be financially capable of paying you. So, um, you know, separate insurance. Um, the type of policies, you can have a policy that just covers you for everything you do all year. You can have a cop policy that covers a spe specific trip or transit. The Postal Service, I don't know if y'all ever bought theirs. I bought it from FedEx once. I made a mistake of buying a very expensive paintings for some friends that were moving. They're like, we're moving. I said, oh, no problem, I'll just ship it to you. And I take it to FedEx. I think that FedEx employee spent the entire rest of the day packaging things like up. I was worried they wouldn't be able to open it when they got it because that thing was wrapped. So I bought the insurance. It was like 90 bucks. That's pretty expensive insurance to ship something. But they got it. They they said, yeah, it took us a while to get it out of the box because um, that person just kept wrapping and wrapping. It was like three feet thicker than when I took it. Um, but. Yeah, if, if you're sending something that expensive and that fragile, yeah, it, it can get expensive. I, I wish I had a video. Um, this was back before you could do it and get away with it, but I was at the Postal Service and a guy was talking about the insurance because he had something really fragile. And the, the, the UPS employee was explaining how the insurance worked, how much is this thing worth and all that. I think, okay, well, this guy's really worried about this package. And then the, 
GPS guy picks up the package and tosses it literally six feet into a big crate. The guy just about passed out. It's like, uh, don't you wish I had a video of that? I would have been just, I would have been going viral with that one. It was pretty hilarious. They would have thought it would one of those staged ones that you see now on TikTok. Um, so it's important to know. I have not had that many that many issues. I don't think about it when I order stuff because it's usually stuff I can just buy again. I know once, I think it was UPS, I bought some scores, some Mahler scores. So they're pretty thick paper. I don't know if y'all know Gustav Mahler, but his symphonies are like an hour, an hour and a half. So the th scores are pretty thick. I ordered three or four of them and the UPS person, it, was a, it wasn't raining when he got there. So he put it right underneath the awning and then it started raining. So the water was just right on the package. So I called the music company and they said, not our fault, but UPS, I, UPS paid for it and sent me a new score. I had the old scores that were slightly damaged and they let me keep those. So now I have double score. So I actually worked out in my favor. I was kind of happy it happened. Um, so I got two of them now, but so I don't know if any of y'all have lost, actually lost something that wasn't insured in transit. It's something to think about before you send something. Now, one thing I'd love to see would be the mail services, uh, actual transit insurance financials. My guess is they're probably making a small fortune on that, but who knows, or maybe they're outsourcing that. I don't know. That would be a good paper too. Is, is the mail service self-insuring? Are they actually charging a premium that's actually going to an insurance company that's covering it? I don't know. What are their claims? What's their loss ratio? Those would all be interesting pieces of information. I don't know if that's available anywhere, but that would be an interesting piece of information. I'm sure they they sell millions of dollars worth of this every year, if not uh, even more than that. All right, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on liability. Uh, a lot of this commercial liability also applies to your homeowners. We didn't get as much in the liability on homeowners. <clears throat> so what kind of liabilities can you have? Well, you can be criminally, criminally liable. Your insurance doesn't cover you that. You can be contract contractually liable, which is actually one of the reasons we have contracts is to hold people responsible when things don't happen. Insurance doesn't cover you for that. So insurance is covering you for the liability of tort. So you hear tort reform, those type of things related to this type of thing. So a tort is a wrong, just means a wrong that you do to someone. If someone does to someone, there's a, a few types. There's negligence, intentional, and strict liability. We're going to talk more about strict liability when we do workers' comp, because that's where that falls in. But our main focus is on negligence. So this is something that's unintentional. But you do something you didn't mean to do it, and it ends up causing someone a loss. A special case is gross negligence, and you can't even be criminally li criminally liable if your negligence is so horrendous that you know it's just, it just just goes against the conscience. Um, so why why are you getting sued for this? Because accordingly, according to our our system of justice, you as a member of society have a duty of care to act in a certain way in certain circumstances. The key is what are you expected to do? You're not expected, you know, to risk your life to help someone or, you know, there's there's limits, but then it's up to, you know, the courts to decide. Um, we will, insurance does cover some intentional acts like libel, slander, false imprisonment. So some of those are actually covered. So not everything falls under you know, just uh, unintentional acts. To have a claim, the person has to have been injured. I, I watched Judge Judy, so I'm not a big Judge Judy fan. I like uh, Mill Yan a lot better. I don't know if y'all watched her. Her program just got canceled. I don't know why, because her program seemed a lot better to me. To me, Judge Judy, she she contradicts my business law class far too many times. It's like, I know you're lying and that's kind of her thing. I can read people's face. So she's kind of more, I think she's more acting, you know, it's kind of an entertaining TV program. Do y'all know who Mel Yan is? I've never heard her name before. I think I love watching her program because it's like, yeah, I remember that from business law. She says things that so she keeps it pretty entertaining. Um, so, but Judge Judy, on the, some of these, Claims she gets, you know, she does it exactly right. It's like, you know, hurt feelings. No, you, you got to have damages. You can't just sue because someone made you mad. And that's a lot of those counter suits, right? What do they call it? 
I'm suing them for harassment. Y'all heard that? Yeah, I want seven thousand dollars for harassment. It's like, no, forget it. And she just misses those. So I agree with her on that. Some of the other stuff she does is like kind of. Um, so you have to have actual damages. Now it doesn't have to be monetary damages. So pain and suffering can be covered, um, but there has to be something of substance there. So when does a tort? When are you? When can you be sued? So you have a duty of care. Now, if any of y'all, and I keep forgetting how old I am. So y'all don't, y'all never even heard of Seinfeld. Y'all don't know who he is, right? Have y'all watched Seinfeld in your life? All right. So the last episode of Seinfeld, they're being criminally charged for this type of thing, saying they had a duty to whatever. I forget what they're charged for. I saw a lawyer talking about this show and say he's just completely ridiculous. But I was like, I thought it was a pretty decent way for him to get off. But um, so you have some responsibility. That was what that show was about. They had a responsibility to do a certain thing. Um, so first of all, um, the person suing you was owed some duty of care from you. You didn't perform that duty. Your failure to perform that duty directly caused an injury. There must be damage and it must be there has to be a relationship between these your act failure to act and the damage the action sort of approximate cause of the damage can't be just so remote and then there is a subjectivity to it and our court system is a little unfair in that it does occasionally intentionally rule incorrectly because someone has deep pockets so you'll see cases where they say you know what you're really not negligent, but you know what? You've got money. They don't. It's really a horrible event. So yeah, we're just going to go ahead. So those happen every once in a while. Um, we'll talk about a couple of those. But um, so unintentional and intentional. So intentional defamation of character. Libel is when it's written. Slander is when it's spoken. The rules in the U.S. and the rules in the U.K. are very, very different. I hope you've seen some of these um, these stories. The media in UK are very different than the media in US. You can be sued so much easier, more easily in the UK than you can here. So every country has their own rules. It's very, very, you know. Be careful if you go, if you go to UK, don't start writing a bunch of articles. You'd be really shocked at what you can get sued for there, or actually you can go to jail there for. So uh, trespass, but again, with trespass, there has to be damages. Just the fact that you're on someone's property, they can't just sue you, even if they have a sign up that says no trespassing. Trespassing can be a criminal offense, but they can't sue you unless you actually did damage. Theft is is an intentional act. Theft is a crime, so that one be covered. But conversion is could be like you actually you take their stuff because you think it's yours. You know, it's like there's not the intent actually. Still, there's just some mistake going on. Assault is you you say something that makes them fear for their life. Again, there's got to be damages, but they're, you know, the fact that they're in, in grave uh, fear of their life and then battery doing actual damage. I think we use the word assault a lot when we mean battery, but and in false imprisonment, there's been some interesting cases on false imprisonment. I think the worst ones are um, some of these scammers call like a restaurant and tell them to that one of their employees is being investigated they need to lock them up until the police get there i don't know if you've seen some of these they're pretty horrendous there's some pretty evil people out there and you know that's obviously that restaurant can get sued for doing that um <clears throat> you can't just tell people hey we're gonna put you we're gonna lock you up until the police gets here you know you you're, you're taking some risks there um all right damages this is pretty important what are these damages that we can get there's compensatory and there's punitive damage compensatory are those that are straightforward monetary damages you have bills you can prove so those are special damages and there is those that are more subjective pain and suffering um which is covered but you know you're, you're gonna have to show some something beyond you know just minor so compensatory damages and then punitive damages we'll talk some cases on punitive damage um essentially what you're saying is what the defendant did was so egregious we're going to give the person more money they really deserve to try to set up an example to them. <clears throat> Most articles, and we'll see this, we're going to talk about this when we talk about um, um, 
asbestos and um, uh, physicians, um, most of the tort reform articles are, re are really focused in on the punitive damages. Most people only have trouble with people getting paid, their actual medical bills are getting paid or going through um, horrific pain and suffering. So let's look at a few examples of these punitive dam damages. So uh, some of y'all probably heard the McDonald's coffee, although it's probably not as popular. Um, I think for quite some time, it was kind of the joke on late night TV. I somewhat disagree that I think this is a legitimate case. So y'all may disagree with me, but I, I think I think she had a really good case. I don't know if y'all heard this as like bad, bad uh, legal case. So I, I thought pretty good case. So this lady was at McDonald's. Um, 1994 became just like kind of the poster child for tort reform. The jury awarded her $160,000 for medical expenses um, and then 2.7 for punitive damages. Now, she didn't get that, but that's what the jury. So that's the thing that you know, a lot of people are talking about this case on the numbers she didn't get when they later reduced the amount. But anyway. Um, now, the first thing to start off with, she was badly harmed. <laughs> so you got to start with that. She had third degree burns. She spilled hot coffee that she bought from McDonald's. So the judge reduced the final ver ver uh, verdict so that she didn't get 2.7, but, um, and we don't know exactly what she got. <clears throat> so a lot of people say frivolous. The poster child, you don't know what poster child is? I did that in class once and I had someone not from the US, it's like, I don't know what you're talking about. So poster child, you know, that's like a quintessential example. Um, a meaningful and worthy lawsuit. So what, what is it? Is it excessive or is it meaningful? So they argued, now part of this is McDonald's had to do something that was negligent. So what did McDonald's do? And the argument from her lawyer was that the coffee was defective. Both the coffee and the coffee cup were defective. So how can coffee be defective? It's way too hot, hotter than it really needs to be. How can a coffee cup be a defective? There's something wrong with the lid, obviously. Um, so the coffee was too hot. And um, they had done this many times before. So the case was materially accurate, claims that the vast majority of judges who consider similar cases to miss them before they get to jury and argue that McDonald's refused to offer more than $800 settlement. So they offered her $800. She had $10,000 in medical bills. So that's kind of insulting <laughs> to start with. Um, so, so essentially what people are saying, you just gotta be careful. Shouldn't be spilling coffee on yourself. How many of y'all would assume a cup of coffee would cause third degree burns? Does that sound right to you? <laughs> so that by itself, you got to say, should someone go in knowing, hey, if I spill this on myself, it's gonna, I mean, most of us think I can spill coffee, it's going to hurt a little bit and you know, I'll, maybe my clothes get stained. We're not thinking we're going to the hospital for skin grafts. So that by itself, you know, does, is it reasonable for her to have known this could happen? Another thing that I think is important is she's 79 years old. So a third degree burns for a 79-year-old, especially with skin grafts, is a much different center matter. She ordered a 49 cent, I don't know what their coffee is today. Um, she was in the passenger seat, so she wasn't driving. So I think some people say, hey, she's trying to drive with coffee, but she wasn't driving, she was riding. Um, her grandson parked the car so she could add cream, so they weren't actually moving. She placed the coffee cup between her knees and pulled the far side of the lid toward her to remove it. In the process, she spilled the entire cup on her lap. She's wearing sweatpants, so that didn't help. That's not McDonald's fault, but you know it kind of contributed to it. They absorbed the coffee and held it against her skin, scalding her. She was taken to the hospital where it's determined she had suffered third degree burns on 6% of her skin and lesser burns that were 16%. She remained in the hospital. I mean, look at that. She remained in the hospital for eight days and underwent skin grafting. Did y'all hear that in any of the late night TV shows? <laughs> skin grafting. Uh, during this period, she lost 20 pounds, nearly 20%. And we're talking about a 79-year-old 79, 79 woman don't need to lose 20 pounds yet generally. She was down to 83 pounds. Wow, that is a very light person. 
two years of medical treatment followed. So you got to you got to start off with she was injured. No question. She had serious injuries. So this wasn't someone spilled coffee in her lap and, you know, got a stain on her sweat. She got serious injuries. So the only question was McDonald's uh, liable. And so what the court decided was she was liable, but so was McDonald's. So what they said was McDonald's was 80% responsible and she was 20%. Now, I don't know what the 20, I don't know how they come up with 80, 20. McDonald's says, hey, there was a warning on the coffee cup. The jury decided the warning was neither large enough nor sufficient. I mean, any of y'all look, read your warning labels in your coffee cups. <laughs> um, so she so got 200,000 compensatory damages. That was reduced to 160,000. And then the 2.7 million got reduced to something else. Um, so what they said is we got to make the punitive damages large enough to be material to this massive corporation because if we just make it, you know, 200,000 bucks, that's no big deal to McDonald's. So we got to make material. Now, another issue here is which McDonald's? Because McDonald's is a franchise. So is she suing the franchise owner or is she suing McDonald's corporate? Which would she want to sue? Obviously, the corporation. Well, who's at fault for making the coffee too hot? Is it the corporation or the franchise? Well, it's a corporate policy. So, you know, they're going to go after the biggest. So, if this had been just a local franchise, then maybe 100,000, 200,000 would have been enough for punitive. But you're suing the corporation. You got to make it large enough to make it pay. Um, so, they sued McDonald's for two days worth of coffee revenues. The, the judge reduced the punitive damage. Um, the decision was appealed by both McDonald's and them in December, but the party settled out of court um, for less than 600,000. So she didn't do badly, 600,000. The lawyer probably got 250, 300,000 of that, but she probably got some money in that. Um, McDonald's argued that they have to make the coffee that hot because that's what makes the taste so good. So they are intentionally making it extremely hot. They're, they know they're intentionally making it extremely hot that it can burn people. So they knew that because they had burned people before. That's what the jury is looking at. You might disagree with the amount. I don't think you can say it's frivolous. I don't, you might want to argue this is still frivolous. Frivolous doesn't sound right. You could argue that McDonald's should have won, but I think it's hard to argue this is a frivolous case. Does 2.7 million sound too much if this were your grandmother? 70 hour woman in the hospital with skin grafts um, for a company that had injured people before and never did, you know, I, I think I think you can argue that that was at least worthy of, of them asking for it. So that's not my frivolous lawsuit. This is my frivolous lawsuit, but y'all might disagree on this one. So I don't know if y'all heard of this one. Ira Gore, I don't think it's related to our former vice president, but Ira Gore. Uh, bought a new BMW and later discovered that it had been slightly damaged in transport and BMW had to repaint it. And when he found that out, uh, that BMW actually had a policy to resell slightly damaged cars. If it could be fixed for less than 3% of the car, uh, the, the doctor sued and a jury awarded him $4,000 compensatory damages and two million uh, and four million dollars in punitive damages. All right? Does this sound the same as McDonald's? Well, if you had a vote between McDonald's and BMW, <laughs> where would you go here? Um, no skin grafts. So they agreed the damages were pretty minor. So this was a case of penalizing BMW, and the whole thing here is BMW needs to tell their customers when they damage the cars they're selling. So that was the big, that was the whole basis of this case. And I, I guess, you know, that sounds, that sounds good to me. And the argument for making it so large is if you make it, you know, you double the compensatory damages, 8,000, it's just not that much. This went to court. So, you know, this costs BMW thousands of dollars in legal fees. So, you know, they're willing to fight this. Why are they willing to fight it? Well, maybe because, they don't want to give up on this policy because it'd be too expensive for them, you know, to do anything else. Uh, I don't know how many of their cars get damaged in transport, um, but that one seemed a little bit much. Uh, the damage, the 
Punitive damages must be reasonably necessary to vindicate the state's legitimate in, in interest in punishment and deterrence. They can't be grossly excessive. Um, so the court found that the excessive will have punitive damages in this case violated the due process clause of so this case. Um, was went up to the Supreme Court. Um, the degree of rep reprehensibility, the defendant's conduct had to be taken into consideration. They did look at the ratio of compensatory damages. You know, the compensatory damages is one dollar, and punitives is three million. You know, they take that consideration. Um, and then they say, what, what could legally could a a a court just out of you know just normal a regulatory process could be able to, to charge against them. So the court found that BMW's contact was not particularly reprehensible. There was no reckless disregard because this is the argument on McDonald's side. McDonald's knew people were getting hurt. They had cases before and they kept doing it. You can't really say that for BMW. You couldn't say people were really getting. So it wasn't like BMW knew that these cars were going to resell at a lower price because of that damage. And so they they went ahead and did it anyway. They, there's no evidence of that. Um, this criminal damages available for similar would be $2,000. So if regulators came in, that's the most. Um, the court noted, however, that these factors could be overwritten if it was necessary to deter future conduct. The Supreme Court ordered a new trial unless the plaintiff accepted. Um, 50,000 of punitive damage, the court reasoned that it may not be given a sufficient weight. So, so anyway, but but he was awarded by the jury 4 million. The, uh, it was reduced and reduced and reduced. So finally he came down to 50,000. So, uh, but still 50,000, I don't know what a BMW cost back then. So he probably got that car since he for free. I think probably the only winner here was probably the lawyers. <laughs> they all made a fortune on that. So, um, do y'all y'all have any um, tort abuse cases that you're aware of? Uh, how far down do we have to go before McDonald's comes up? So I, I don't know what would what would be it. Rivalous law suit. Top 10 frivolous lawsuits. I don't know what would come up. I have no idea. Not a, the photo kind of tells you. Yeah, criminal suing for injuries. That's that's an interesting one. Careless hug. That's kind of an interesting one. Nursing student fails course twice. If y'all sue me for that, you know, New York woman filed 40 million lawsuit over like five or six scratches um, from a gas explosion blocks away. <laughs> um, these, these are all property and casualty type of claims almost, most of them. Florida woman is suing FedEx for tripping over a package left at her doorstep. That one could be legitimate. I mean, depending on where they put it, I, I could see that one. An officer in New North Carolina is suing Starbucks over hot coffee. So there's another hot coffee one, but this time Starbucks. So we almost got the McDonald's. Claiming injury from a flying dinner roll. Uh, fakes coffee burns and then sues McDonald's. I, I, that's not the one we just read. Um, so yeah, McDonald's made it, but not this particular case. Um, I I think the worst, uh, I'll just say, I think the worst frivolous lawsuit is, um, and y'all probably have seen this one. Have y'all seen this one? So this guy sued the laundromat. Y'all seen that one, right? So he lost his pants and he sued for I forget how much he sued for. It was pretty ridiculous. Um, he sued for 67 million because they lost his pants. Um, and he ended up getting in trouble because he was a lawyer and the judges are like, you should know better. But you should read that case. It's pretty 
So he demanded 15,000 for emotional distress, 15,000 for punitive damages. And then he, the 67 million was based on this false advertising because this laundromat had several locations and they had the thing that said um, satisfaction guarantee. And so he sued based on how many times they made that ever. It was a ridiculous lawsuit, no, no question. And what's really sad is he really destroyed this, this family-owned business, did them huge damage. Uh, and they were bending over backwards to try to reconcile the whole thing for them. So it was just so I, I don't know if I can find a bigger horrible lawsuit than that. I'm sure there's some out there, but all right. So let's say someone sues you for this as a business or individually. What are your defenses? One is that they consented to this. Contributory negligence. So you saw that in the McDonald's case. It used to be in the past that that would completely destroy the entire case, but now juries they look at it 80 20 70 30 whatever and the case still goes forward and then they just split it up based on contributory negligence and then there's the last chance so you're doing something that's negligent and they could have done something to stop the whole thing but they kept going so yeah it was your fault but their fault for not stopping so um so if the plaintiff can show that his negligence had been spent and the defendant had a last clear chance to avoid the in injury, that would be a, uh, a defense. Illegal act, um, that's kind of, you know, the people suing because they break into someone's house and they slip and fall and I think, no. If you break into someone's house and they have it booby trapped, I think you might be able to sue in that case because you're not supposed to booby trap your houses, but... Um, if, if it's intentional, you're, you're, at least in the United States, your protection for libel and slander is that you're telling the truth unless you have some kind of confidential relationship with the person. But yeah, if you're, if you're telling the truth, it's, it's fine. Um, I shouldn't bring this up, but I, I just read the book on, on um, a, a very famous director of the CDC. And it's a pretty inflammatory book <laughs> written by Robert Kennedy. But I haven't heard this guy is going to sue him. But to me, if it's if there's libel and slander in that, that's when you would sue. So I'm kind of curious if he's, uh, I don't know if anyone's heard if he's planning on suing or not, but kind of makes you work, wonder if he doesn't sue, if there's maybe some truth to what was written about him, but uh, pretty, pretty extreme. Uh, a famous, famous, famous uh, libel case is uh, Carol Burnett. Y'all don't even know who she is. Yeah, 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 she's still going. Um, no, not that one. Yeah, she sued the National Enquirer and she won. This is an interesting case. Um, y'all y'all heard of her or not? Yeah, 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 y'all know her. She's, if you lived in the 70s, you knew Carol Burnett because she was like the most famous TV show going back then. Um, so National Enquirer wrote Four sentences about her. She essentially is at a restaurant. She ran into Henry Kissinger, you know, so not the places I go to restaurants, but ran into his, Henry Kissinger. I think she went over and, you know, they shared a dessert or something like that. And the National Enquirer wrote this whole thing about her being drunk and tipsy and running around the place. None of that was true. Made her look really bad. She she can argue, you know, this is my career. This is my, you know, this is my reputation. Um, so NASCAR wrote that Kurt Burnett went around letting everyone taste her dessert and then spilled a glass of wine on someone to finish. The magazine reported that this person was unamused to have wine spilled on them and retaliated spilling water on Burnett. After the article's publication, Burnett contacted her lawyers and with a week, her team demanded the magazine retract. When it didn't, the case went to court and reported that Burnett was completely sickened by the allegations. And so she won this court case is pretty important because First of all, it's the National Enquirer, which may not exist anymore, but we all knew everything in there was fake anyway. So, but she still won the lawsuit. Um, wow, that's an interesting title. Queen 92 dying. And that was probably written 20 years ago. Um, yeah, so courts say Enquirer is not a newspaper. 
uh, try to claim that it wasn't wasn't eight different iron magazines since the two are held in this uh, different journalistic standards. Um, yeah, there's there's her program. Doesn't look all that funny today, but back then this was really hilarious. So you know the kind of the times have changed. She was she's really a uh, pretty pretty entertaining person. But anyway, so there are cases like that that have you know have won and have gotten quite a bit of uh, publicity about them. Um, and then the last thing you can do is you got to prove that you actually weren't negligent. Just because what you did caused someone injury, if you did what you would be expected to do and everybody else to do. So that's the prudent person rule. You acted in a way that's customary for a person to act. And even doing that, someone someone got, got harmed. This is not the prudent expert rule. So we'll come to the prudent expert rule. Liability when you're a doctor or a lawyer or an actuary or an investment person, that's a completely different standard. So the prudent person rule is just the average person on the street. A prudent expert rule is not acting in a way that person has trained as well as you are. And that's when you have to buy professional liability. It's a very different. So you're this kind of general liability is not going to cover you for those professional types of acts. It's covering you for, you know, when your employees do something that's just, you know, negligent, they should have, they should have uh, known better. Uh, professional liability, also known as errors and omission, is is where we're going to go next. We're going to talk a little bit about malpractice. Uh, malpractice, errors, mistakes. You saw a little bit of that in the Warren Buffett article when he talked about directors and officers. Um, okay, so what I want to do is show you where we're going to go from here so you know what articles we're going to read. So under miscellaneous materials, and I'll put this in my email. All right, there's tort article one, tort article two, and asbestos articles. So asbestos is still a big deal today. You still hear it in the news. So this first article, um, it's very dated. But I want to show it to you because I want to show you the shift in the type of tort. And this this one hit right at the cusp. Well, I want to show you the shift in certain types of torts versus others. And you'll see that definitely in this article and it's and it's highlighted. It's kind of friendly looking judge on the front. Article number two is what I want to show you is what tort reform is. We're gonna go through this one fairly quickly. So this one, you don't necessarily need to read in advance. What I wanna do is just define what is tort reform. So this article was written right in the middle of a major debate in the United States on tort reform. And so it went state by state by state. Well, what does it mean? You're gonna see a pattern. So when you hear tort reform, you're gonna see what, it, what does it mean? What are they actually reforming? So we'll, we'll walk through that. We'll go through it pretty quick, quickly. You can kind of see a list of the type of things that would be in there. Uh, it's kind of left the news, so you can't really see that anymore. And then we'll spend quite a bit of time on asbestos. Um, so asbestos, obviously a very dangerous um, product, causes a special type of cancer. So I think you're going to see some parallels with this issue, what we saw with mold. That there is some, some shadiness going on here, probably even more so than with the mold. Uh, some pretty fake claims being being paid. And it's just one of these cases, and this is this is a very perfect example, that the, the scam claims get paid because they're small, and the most serious claims don't get paid because they're large and people fight them. And it's that kind of exactly that kind of that kind of case. And until this one judge got her hands on it, and we'll, we'll see what she did. She radically changed this whole thing. This was a huge issue in the news at the time when it happened. And uh, I remember the Wall Street Journal had a whole article on this. Wall Street Journal came out very much um, opposed to what was going on in the court system. Essentially, what lawyers, plaintiff lawyers were doing were stopping jurisdiction. We'll talk some about that. They were finding in, in all these cases were going to the same judge because this judge is you know, this jury system in this particular location was the plaintiffs are winning all kinds of money. 
And so there was a lot of reform that came up and really came from one particular lawyer in particular. So it's a good special case on on the on um, on asbestos. So we'll go there. Um, we'll talk some on um, professional liability, some on um, asbestos. We might get the workers' comp a little early. One thing I want you to do over the break, when you're sitting at the beach and you're all bored, is pick your paper two topic now that exam one's out of the way. So when you get back from break, I want everybody's paper two topic decided on. Okay, has anyone decided yet? Or still thinking about it? I mean, you got some really good topics. On I mean, some of the stuff you're like, I'm like. I, I couldn't pick because they're all pretty interesting topics. There's so much you can do out there. So when you get back from the break, yeah, I want to uh, finalize that. All right, since it's spring break, I'll let you out a little bit early. <laughs> 